hello, hello. Welcome back to The 100 Report. I'm Chris. I'm Charlie. And today we have a really special guest. We have a professional joining us today. <laughs> no, yeah, it's so much better when we have professionals. <laughs> um, that's how it is. It's Stefan Schemmelt, BBC journalist, and you may have seen his name pop up uh, throughout all of the text commentary, and you will see him routinely interviewing people like Jonathan Agnew and all over the world. But anyway, that's enough of that. Let's get straight into the interview. Stefan Schemmelt, BBC sports journalist, welcome to The 100 Report. How are you doing? I'm very well, thank you. Thank you for having me. Very excited to be here. Uh, and yeah, ho hopefully we're going to have some fun over the next, well, however long you keep me here for. <laughs> well, 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 we'll try. We'll see how you fare. Um, I've got to address the elephant in the room because um, we didn't go through uh, managers or contacts or anything because we grew up together. Yeah, and if you tried to go through my manager, I suppose you would have asked her, to ask my other half. She may think she's my manager, uh, but yeah, I don't have one. So it, it would have been a very short conversation. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so we, like, we never actually went to school together, though, did we? No, that's true. We, bound, we bonded over a love of music and drinking, it has to be said, uh, festivals. Yeah. Uh, and the cricket thing came later, I guess. It came after those other things. Well, I think, uh, yeah, that's, that's sort of true, because... I always remember when you, when we were younger, you were always cricketing, you were always playing cricket. And I actually, I never really got into cricket until the 2005 Ashes, which was, well, I'd have been, I'd have been 18, 19 at that point. So that was sort of past that point. But I've, you've always been my sort of go-to for the person who knows a lot about cricket and plays a lot of cricket as well. It, it's interesting because I look back on those times when there would be, times when you guys were off doing things that all teenage boys do and I was in my whites off playing cricket every Saturday afternoon Sunday morning and any other time that I could have done it and I do wonder like do I regret that because I've not turned out to be a professional cricket I, I never thought I was going to be but I, I do wonder you know do I wish that I'd spent doing more times doing things that weren't cricket but then actually I think about uh, would I have my job that I have now which I love um, yeah. I met my I met my other half through work which would I've been doing that job if I hadn't been into as cricket is into cricket as I was then probably not wouldn't have my son so yeah cricket's given me a lot and I, I'm very grateful for that things happen for a reason um, they Stephen, do. I need to ask you because Chris refers to you as the Jeffrey Boycott of Stoke-on-Trent and I need to ask you what's that about uh, uh <laughs> I do bat like him I, I don't hit it very far I don't get any runs anymore I haven't got any runs for a long time my cricket skills have gradually declined but when I was at my peak, even then, the ball did not go very far when it left my bat. So I think that's probably what he's referring to. <laughs> <laughs> when I do play, uh, I keep wicket, um, which I very much enjoy. I don't think I would end... I'm not sure I'd play cricket anymore if I didn't keep wicket. Because keeping wicket keeps you in the game. It's the, the, you've always got something to do when you're keeping wicket. And particularly if, like me, runs are not as prevalent as they used to be, then keeping wicket gives you a reason to play. And I like catching the ball. I like jumping around and, and diving on the ground. Uh, but yeah, batting, maybe let's not talk about that so much anymore. <laughs> all right, all right, that's duly noted. I've, I've always had a profound respect for wicket keepers because uh, a mutual friend of ours, Chris Wilkinson, also he keeps wicket for another North Staffordshire League team. And Sometimes if I've played like a sixes match with him or something like that, where you, you have to keep wicket to them, um, I'm dreadful. I, I, I'm so bad at keeping wicket because I've always, if I've ever played, I usually bat, you know, usually 11. If there was a spot lower, that's usually where I bat and bowl. And if you ever ask me to keep wicket or ask me to field in the deep, it's, it's a non-starter. You might as well just not bother. But you, you've got a natural disadvantage to keeping wicket because you are very tall. I mean, I'm tall for a wicket keeper and you are a good couple of inches taller than I am. So that is tough. OK, well, that's, that's, that, that makes me feel slightly better, I guess. <laughs> um, I think it would be very interesting for the listeners and for me, actually, to understand how you got into the job that you do and getting into sports journalism. And yeah, could you sort of walk us through how you, how you got there? Blind luck. <laughs> a lot of it is a lot of it is blind luck. 
Um, so I guess as we've touched on, it was always cricket for me, and I always wanted to do something in cricket. And so after I finished university when I was 21, I went off uh, to Australia to actually coach in Sydney for a little while. I coached at a school for one winter. During the winter um, in 2006-07, when England lost 5-0 in the Ashes the first time. Well, the first time, most recently anyway. Uh, so I was a cricket coach in Australia whilst, Austra whilst England were getting beaten all the way around Australia, which was fun. Uh, and before then, I'd sort of dabbled in a little bit of student journalism, actually written about music. And I wasn't very qualified to write about music. And I thought, oh, I'll just leave the whole journalism thing. But whilst I was in Australia and England were there, and I was at a test match in Brisbane, and I looked at the press box and I thought, oh, I'll tell you what, that looks like a good job to get paid to watch cricket. So I wondered how I could get into it. And not long afterwards, the BBC advertised for work experience placements. They were going to put someone do work experience in every local radio station around the country. There's 40 of them. Whilst I was still in Australia, I applied. When I come back, I had an interview. I got it. And that's pretty much it. That, that's it. Everything went from there. So I did a little bit of broadcasting at Radio Stoke. Then I fell into the writing, gradually moved around in different parts of the BBC to the point where I found myself doing what I do now, which is writing about cricket 90% of my time and also dabbling in a little bit of broadcasting as well, uh, be that you know reporting or interviewing or commentating. So, yeah, a lot of it was being in the right place at the right time. Um, it's, it's so funny because... I remember usually when you were doing, I think it was when you were doing a particular test series and you were doing the live commentary for it. Um, there was a few of us from, from back home who were always trying to get one of our questions on and we thought, oh, we've got an in here. But I think that just, it must be strange because if you're answering all of these questions and imagine you get thousands of them every time that they come through and it's difficult to filter. And it's not always you reading them either. So if you've got your head down, concentrating on the action more often than not there'll be someone else looking at things like twitter and text messages and emails and pushing them through to you to then where you can might you might answer or you might ignore them or you might bounce off them and throw a question back or whatever um so yeah if anyone has ever read the bbc sports live text page there'll always just be one name at the top but that's a little bit misleading because there are lots of little people not little people, we all do the same job, we share the jobs around, but there are lots of people beavering away in the background to make it happen. Right. I definitely heard you recently interview Don Jonathan Agnew, who's one of my all-time favourites. I love listening to him. He's got the most beautiful quality voice. I love listening to what he has to say. Um, do you enjoy interviewing him? Yeah, so <clears throat> I guess it's obviously, um, he's the voice of TMS, he's the BBC cricket correspondent. I talked to him. Uh, pretty often on, on, on different things and yeah I mean he is he is the cricket radio broadcaster isn't he yeah. uh, obviously he had uh, a fine playing career himself played for England but he, he gave up at a relatively young age I think he was 30 when he retired and, and moved into into journalism he did some writing and then he became BBC cricket correspondent relatively quickly and yeah, as far as, as radio broadcasters go, I mean, I guess is amongst those that you would aspire to be like for the reasons that you've just that you've just mentioned. And I have to ask you about last summer because you were lucky enough to be a part of, I think, both of the home test series, um, one in Manchester and the other in the Rose Bowl. You were part of the biosecure bubble. How was it to be a part of it? What, what was it to experience? It must have been very bizarre. Uh, I enjoyed it. I did enjoy it because... <laughs> There are a few reasons. Some are very mundane and practical as to why I enjoyed it, and others are slightly more uh, obvious. So, um, straight away, you're waking up on a cricket ground. You've got a hotel room that overlooks the test match. That's fantastic. But there are also practical benefits to that as well. So, when you are normally covering a test match around either the UK or around the world, Test match cricket grounds aren't normally placed in the best location. So take Southampton as an example. There is one road in and there is one, one road out. And if that road gets clogged up, hard to get where you're going to, which is ordinarily a city centre hotel. 
So more often than not, you wake up first thing in the morning, you shovel down some breakfast, you get to the ground as quick as you can. Afterwards, if you're writing, you might be at the ground for two hours after play is finished. Then you get back yourself back into the city, you try and find some dinner and it's bedtime. The best thing about being or staying in a hotel on a cricket ground, I can roll out of bed five minutes before play. I can watch the first I can watch the first session of my boxer shorts if I like. It's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> of course you didn't, because you're far more far too professional for that. Obviously not. No, of course I didn't. Uh, but and also, I, I think we'll talk a little bit more about um, biosecure bubbles and things later on. But I personally, I found them okay. Uh, and the journalists, we were allowed to leave um, in between test matches. So from that point of view, there wasn't a great deal different from how much time say I would spend away from home um, or like I said in some ways it was better everything that I needed to cover a test match was there on site some people were frustrated that they couldn't go off and have dinner in a different restaurant or go to a different bar it didn't really bother me um, but for the players I, I can imagine it would have been much more restrictive because they were staying there in between matches they were living training playing in the same place they couldn't get away from cricket and so I can understand why they would have found it harder than, than my sort of very um, basic pleasures from it. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's interesting that you talk about biosecure bubbles, because that's obviously one of the things that came up, the idea of people rotating in and out and being in that biosecure bubble and how stressful it could be. But I did want to talk a little bit about the England-India series, because obviously that's just uh, finished. But obviously there was quite a lot to talk about and I had such high hopes after that first test that we, that we might win in India, that very rare elusive thing. But uh, what, was you, what were your thoughts on the series in general? I think you've just summed it up quite well there. England lulled us in after that first test match and that is by no means a criticism. They just inflated expectations that were never really realistic. So if you take the winter as a whole, if I'd said to you on January the 2nd, when England flew to Sri Lanka, they'll win in Sri Lanka 2-0 and they'll lose in India 3-1, we'd have probably gone, that's about right. That's pretty respectable, actually. I'll take that as a winter's result. And you're right, when they did outplay India in that first test, there was that thought of, could England do something special here? But even if you put aside everything else that's gone with this winter and the rest of the rotation and all those sorts of things, the fact remains that India are better in Indian conditions. And that first test wasn't proper Indian conditions. It was a flat pitch. England won the toss. They cashed in. In tests two, three and four, when the ball turned, India were vastly superior. Because they are vastly superior, they have better spinners and their batsmen play spin bowling better. I'm not saying that's an excuse, but it is a fact. Mm -hmm. And then the rest of the rotation thing, well, you come back to, did England give themselves the best chance? That is certainly up for debate. Would it have changed the results? I doubt it. Yeah, it, it, it's sort of along the same lines that I was thinking. And one of the things that kept coming up, because I obviously I spend a lot of time on Twitter, I'm always talking cricket, this, that and the other, it got it got quite tasty after the second test. There was a lot of um, bordering on aggression with one another about the state of the pitch and the idea that the, the second test in particular was was an unfit uh, pitch for a test match. But what 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 were your thoughts about? the pitches in general and do you think there's any merit to talking about the quality of the pitches? I think the first thing to say is that these views will probably come along national lines. People have quite trenchant views and any sort of suggestion of uh, skullduggery or whatever is very sensitive. It's like ball tampering. You know, these are almost cricketing taboos really. And if India did choose to play on pitches that suited them firstly there is no problem with that um i'm sure that when india come to england later on this summer there will be green pitches that nip around where england will have the ascendancy mm -hmm. and the other thing to look at it's actually quite a big compliment to england 
because in that first test, when the pitch was flat, when the spinners didn't have quite so much influence, um, England won. Yeah, and that that is only the that is the second defeat in thirty eight home test matches for India, going back to the start of twenty thirteen. They were faced with the prospect of losing their proud home record and not reaching the World Test Championship final. So they reverted to type. They went back to what they knew and they beat England. But don't forget, England had chances to win those. Certainly the third and fourth test matches. Halfway through the third test, um, when the scores were relatively level after, after the first innings, England had a chance and they got bowled out. At T on the second day of the fourth test, India were about 60 behind with um, six first innings wickets down. Then Rishabh Pant happened and India won by an innings. England had their chances in the third and fourth test matches. With hindsight, they will know they picked the wrong team in both of them. But you'll still come back to this. The fact that India are better in those conditions and it's up to England to improve the next time they go to India. Just going back to the point about the spinners, obviously India totally outplayed us and it's a shame because obviously coming off the back of quite a successful tour in Sri Lanka beforehand, where our spinners really did perform really well, um, without going on a Michael Vaughan type uh, rant about the rotation policy, do you think that had something to do with it in terms of uh, how Don Bess was played and then rested and Moen Ali asked to stay, to stay on and he wasn't and sort of they got messed around a little bit with that. Yeah, and I think England would say if they had their time again, looking at the rest and rotation policy as a whole, the Moeen and Best situation is probably the one where it really did fall down. Don Bess was bowling okay in Sri Lanka and in the first test match against India. He admitted himself he was taking wickets without bowling at his best but he was still taking wickets. England decided that they wanted to leave him out for the second test, but the plan was for Moeen to go home for the third and fourth. In hindsight, should they have asked Moeen to stay on before the second test? And um, if he said no, not pick him for the second test? Probably. Um, but they just got themselves into a little bit of a muddle. And then afterwards... On the, in the third test, when, um, as we found out, the pitches were really suiting the spin bowlers, and England went in with three pace bowlers expecting the pink ball to nip around. They didn't pick best then. They went back to him for the fourth test, and he was clearly not at his best, short on confidence. We could Everyone who could see that could see he was struggling. So that is a situation that they are going to have to manage from now on to get Don Bess back to the best he can be. Sure, for sure. Um, you mentioned Rishabh Pant. Um, from a wicketkeeper's perspective, and not just that, from just a cricketing perspective, he's certainly somebody or a player that I've been aware of, obviously, through the IPL. And, um, you know, since the days of Dhoni, they've been looking for a wicketkeeper to replace somebody of Dhoni's calibre. Um, how do you feel about Rishabh Pant and his prospects? As a future, as a future player for India in general, very hard not to be excited about watching him play. I think I remember the first time I saw him was when India toured here in 2018. His wicketkeeping was awful. It was like he had two dustbin lids attached to his hands. He didn't look like he was going to catch anything. <laughs> but he got a very good hundred in the last Test match at the Oval, and it was obvious he could bat. The question marks were over his keeping. And, and they've actually been the, the dilemma that, that India have been wrestling with. They've got, a, since Dhoni um, retired, they've had a very good wicketkeeper in Ridham and Saha, who I think is about 36 now, but widely accepted as one of the, the best wicketkeepers in the world. This is almost a Ben Folks, Joss Butler debate, really. Saha, fantastic wicketkeeper, more than capable batsman. He's opened the batting in the IPL and he's got runs. Um, but Rishabh Pant, this explosive batsman, who had the advantage um, from that point of view. It was Saha who began the series in Australia that, that India won. Rishabh Pant was out of the side then. I think he was in and out throughout those four test matches before he came back and played 
um, a really important innings in their, their victory at Brisbane. And then he's just um, electrified us, hasn't he, in this series. And that 100 in the fourth test was just, you just really want it to be a taste of what's to come. And you've seen comparisons with Gilchrist. Yeah. I don't know about that yet. <laughs> to, to reverse sweep Jimmy Anderson <laughs> over the slips for four <laughs> is, is not only um, astonishing, it's audacious as well. To be able to do that is just fantastic. So who won't be excited about seeing Rishabh Pant walk to the middle? And you saw Jimmy Anderson's reaction as well. And he was just, he didn't know where to look. He, he was impressed himself clearly. And, you know, Rishabh Pant was almost playing a white ball game there. He was going for sixes. He, and he, yeah, his strike rate was incredible. And I have to say Washington Sundar looked really fantastic as well. Um, he's obviously quite new to the new to the side, but he's got um, yeah great prospects. The batting was just fantastic. I, I loved one of the subtitles. I don't know if it was on the BBC website that I saw this or something else, but it just it, um, the caption was "pants on fire," and I just <laughs> it made me laugh so much. I the, 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 the more the more impressive thing about that Risha Pant innings was India were in trouble when he came to the crease, and he had to you know fight every attacking urge in his body to get in to make sure he was then in a position to play those amazing shots. I think he had something like 35 off the first 60-odd balls that he faced. And then from the next 50 balls, he went at more than a runner ball. That was the brilliant part about it. He had to get himself in, and then it was fireworks. And we mentioned before that, um, that you know, if you had predicted before we'd even arrived in India that we'd lose the series 3-1. I think many of us would have taken that and seen that as not a failure in the slightest. But do you think that sort of having won the first test so convincingly um, that, you know, we, we actually were quite disappointed by the fact that we weren't even close in the other three to getting a draw even or another win? That's the thing that will live long in the memory. It's not that England lost. It's the way that they lost. and. Yes, um, we can talk about the opportunities they had to win the third and the fourth test matches, but it's the other things that went with it. And that is the misreading of the conditions in those two test matches. They got their bowling attacks wrong in both of those games. And then, obviously, the rest and the rotation policy, which has proved so controversial and which, um, you know, a number of people are saying... England didn't give themselves the best chance to win in India, which is probably, well, almost certainly, the second most important away series after the Ashes. Mm. And that's the thing that people are remembering. I think that is the disappointing thing. For me, having that Channel 4 presence, that free-to-air um, cricket for a test match as well, obviously the money that goes into that, I think it was only confirmed quite last minute for the first, for the first test that Channel 4 were going to get the rights to it. And then to sort of have a couple of tests that lasted two days, three days, and they've bought the rights to a five-day series. I think that was quite damaging as well. And it was a real shame it didn't last, the fight didn't last longer. Definitely. But being brutally honest, that is not something England will have been thinking about at, at that time. For a number of reasons, you know, their, their plans would have been put in place before they knew that Channel 4 had the rights. Uh, that was a deal that Channel 4 did with the BCCI, not the ECB. And yeah, all the players would say the right things and that they want to put on a show on terrestrial television. They do have a responsibility to grow the game. They know all those things. But I don't think that would have been at the front of their mind when they were approaching this series or, or, or trying to win it or going about it in the way that they did. Yeah, I, I, I think that there's, yeah, there's a lot of merit to that. But speaking of growing the game and getting it on terrestrial TV. Obviously, this podcast is The 100 Report, and what we've got coming up this summer is a game that is going to be um, at least partially on free-to-air TV, and it, kind of its core remit is to grow the game. So what are your thoughts in general about The 100 as a concept and uh, how, uh, how it can grow the game uh, on these shores? I think like a lot of people, my emotions and thoughts about the 100 started off as being quite mixed and um, I don't necessarily think um, that was helped by some of the messages that we had coming out about it 
I think the idea of a competition that is set out the way it is with, with eight teams, men and women, is the right way to go. Whether it, that competition needs to be 100 balls or whether it could have just been um, a 20-over competition uh, is a pretty moot point. And whether or not that competition could have been reinvestment into what we know to be the blast is again is another sort of debate that I don't think we have long enough time to have however putting all those things to one side you cannot deny that the hundred the action on the field is almost certainly going to be fantastic and the product that we see and it sort of hit home for me watching the big bash league um, over the English winter because I think it was not necessarily the success of the IPL, but certainly what people in England saw could be achieved through the big bash that really whetted the appetite for the sort of thing that we're going to see in the 100. And I'm a huge fan of the big bash. I think it's great. I think part of the reason that I loved it so much this winter was seeing um, spectators enjoying a lovely sunny evening whilst we were locked up in a winter lockdown. <laughs> it it just made me realise that you know what if a little just a small part of that can be captured for the hundred, and you go down the rosters of the eight teams, they're fantastic. You look at the way that the the women's competition is getting is getting equal billing, it's going to be brilliant. I, I personally think it's going to be fantastic. I can't wait for it. It's part of an amazing home summer of cricket, you know, involving. England's men's test matches against New Zealand and India, an England women's test match against India. Um, bring it on, I say. I think, I think it's going to be great. I think, I know there are grumblings about the 100, but it is here. English cricket needs to be a success. We need to move on from those problems and just realise that it should be fantastic. And you've touched on the women's game, and obviously that is part of the big success of the BBL as well. It's really successful for the women also. And we know that the ECB strategy is really eight, um, eight teams, but each team has two squads, the men's and the women's, and they are be playing in the same venue now, and they're launching the whole competition with a women's game, which is huge. Do you think this could be a turning point for the women's game? I really hope so, because I would say that English cricket hasn't fully capitalised on England women winning the World Cup in 2017. If you look at the way that women's football has certainly become more mainstream since the England team reached the semi-finals, only the semi-finals of the last Women's World Cup, you would say that that, that sport has been on more of a role in this country than women's cricket. Uh, the ECB will hope that they can capture that with the 100. I think that's certainly the plan. And so, yeah, having things like the very first game of the 100 being a women's game is massive. The equal prize money, absolutely fantastic. And the names that they are managing to attract to the 100, Meg Lanning, Elise Perry, Deandra Dottin, Stefani Taylor, along with all those fantastic England players, the women's competition will be, you know, should be just as intriguing and, and interesting and explosive as the men. I'm really looking forward to some of the double billing uh, matches when they've got both matches on simultaneously. That's for me was a highlight. It's such a shame because I had tickets for about four of them last year, but you know, it was a shame then it's exciting now. And I guess one of the last questions I had was about the idea of the structure changing because it sort of occurred to me that given, you know, we're all cricket fans and we all know how cricket works would you argue that perhaps one of the things that might attract a new audience is the idea that we're all learning a new format together and in some senses having a 10 ball over and having 100 balls per innings is actually slightly easier to learn? Well, that's certainly the hope for the ECB, isn't it? That's one of the reasons why this competition has come around. The honest answer is I don't know because I guess... If you're trying to attract someone to a new sport and this is the only version of that sport that exists, this is the only time you'll ever see 100 ball cricket, or at least at the moment. And then you want people to come into other forms of the game and then you're saying, what, there's six balls in and over, not 10 or five? I can see how that would be confusing. The most interesting thing for me is the allegiances of the teams. Franchise sport has never worked in the UK. We're very traditional. You can trace it back through all sorts, you know, county cricket, 92 and top-level professional football teams, rugby, all that stuff. We are traditional. We are 
we have our allegiances to our teams. If you are a Somerset fan, are you going to be interested in the Welsh fire? Who knows? That is the thing that we're going to find out about it. That, to me, is the most interesting part. And lastly, I know that you um, have your journalist impartial hat on most of the time, but could we twist your arm? Do you have a team that you'd be secretly supporting in this? In the hundred? You know what? I haven't checked. I haven't looked yet. Um, can I get back to you? <laughs> we will chase you on an answer, but yes, of course you can get back to us. I suppose, well, I, I live half an hour south of Old Trafford, so the Manchester Originals should be my team. They're looking strong um, now as well, after the new draft. But having said that, they got rid of Dan Christian, and to me, Dan Christian is T20 Yoda, so that is a foolish move. Uh, so I don't know if I can forgive them for that but for now we'll say the Manchester Originals wow. well that's an excellent that's an excellent way to round it all off well Stefan thank you so much for being on this podcast and thank you for really having me um, so uh, as, as ever to all of our listeners thank you for uh, listening in and uh, joining us if you want to subscribe we're on YouTube at The 100 Report if you want to follow our socials we are on Instagram at The 100 Report we are on Twitter at 100 Report and please do send us all your questions and comments we love hearing from you but thank you once again and uh, we'll, uh, we'll be in touch bye